that sounds like something from an economics class, but it's not. Because in the realm of the spirit, it's not just the more demand there is. In the realm of the spirit, there's infinite supply. So whatever demand ever tries to come on your life, there is a supply bigger than the demand. The emotional demand, the financial demand, the relational demand. I'm here to tell you today that God's supply, which is His grace, is bigger than all demand. Demand is law. Thou shalt, you must, you better, you gotta. But grace is the Lord saying, I will. I will forgive you. I will bless you. I will anoint you. I will walk with you. I will show you my glory, as he said to Moses. So whenever the demands of life, the tension at work, the disappointment with kids, the challenge with money, when those tensions begin to come upon, I want to tell you, look to the supply as greater than the demand. Look to the promise as more than the problem. Look to the provision of God as more than the difficult place you may be in. Now, we're going to move on in today to talking a little bit about giving out of that divine supply. But first, let me just review just quickly what we said last Sunday. We said law is demand, grace is supply. The five loaves and two fishes, perfect example. What was the demand? We're hungry. What was the supply? He looked up gave thanks and saw the supply before it showed up in the middle of the demand. He saw the supply. So in the middle of your demand, do you see more of the demand or do you see more of the promise for the supply? I ask myself that question and every demanding, frustrating, disappointing, heartbreaking, overwhelming, depressing circumstance that all of us have. Are we more focused on the promise that he has given us? or the problem that faces us. I can find myself thinking 10 to one more over the problem, the difficulty, the heartache than I am the promise, which is yes and amen. I wanna tell you that problem's not yes and amen. It's gonna be up and down and all over the place. But somehow we think by focusing totally and giving all of our senses to that problem that somehow that makes it go away. It's called worry. Rather than setting our mind on those things above. So Jesus, but the five loaves and two fishes begins to look and see the supply. And as he does it, he makes that incredible faith statement, I thank you. How simple, how profound, how awesome, how practical. What happened in the uh, wedding feast at Cana? There was a demand. We ran out of wine. We haven't got any more wine. All the guests, oh, they're going to leave. That's going to ruin this whole wedding. So Mary comes over and says, hey, son, please help out. He said, hey, woman, it's not my time, but because you asked me, I will go ahead and do it. So what's he do? He looks straight in the eye of a demand, of a lack. You got lack in your life? I want to tell you, for every lack, there's a supply. For every demand, there's an answer. You say, I may not see it right at this moment, but I promise you by the Holy Spirit, he will show you and will take you to a promise that will allow your heart to be calm while the demands are so heavy. Amen. I promise you, they're always there. So he goes over and takes those six water, great big water things, like 30 gallons each. And you know what those jugs were for? They were for purification water. Isn't it interesting that he deems the purification not just to multiply the water, but to turn it to a type of his blood. That's the only purification that comes. So in the midst of their embarrassment, ever been embarrassed, ever come up short, Ever not have enough money? Mm -hmm. yes. I'm not saying that necessarily he's just going to drop $100 bills out of heaven, but I'll tell you what, his supply is greater than your demand. We talked about Mary and Martha. What happened? What was the demand? We got to get this dinner fixed. We got to get going. You ever had the plight of urgency? It's so urgent. We got to do. What are we going to do? Oh my God, it's not going to work. We're going to fall apart. Oh, oh, oh. And it was Martha's house. It wasn't Mary's house. It was Martha's place. So she said, Dad, come this is my house. And somebody just walks in here and things aren't clean and the situation isn't good. And she complains twice to Jesus. Jesus, won't you tell my sister to come here and help us? Can't you see I'm under a lot of pressure? God, can't you see what I'm going through? And then to Mary, let's Mary have it. Let's Jesus have it. 
So what's Jesus come back and say? Martha, good job in the kitchen. It's wonderful. But Mary has chosen the better way. As a matter of fact, it's a way that will not be taken away from her. And <clears throat> the Mary's done not only one of the good things. You know what Jesus said? This one thing. She sat at the spout where the glory came out. She sat under the supply. Where Martha was trying to get a supply by nervousness, tension, bitterness, upset, blame, all the stuff our flesh loves to do. And Mary sat there. You ever had that time when you're just so nervous and so uptight and you just want to do something about it? And in that moment, the Lord is saying, look to me, look to me, seek first, first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You say, what's the kingdom of God have to do with it? The kingdom of God is the supply. That's the supply house. That's the barn that's full of more than enough. And he said, Pastor, how do you know that? Matthew 10, 7, 8, Jesus says, as you go, preach saying the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he tells you what the kingdom is or part of what the kingdom is. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Seek the supply house, not just for the supply. Was Mary just sitting there before his feet for the supply? No, she was doing what we did today. See, ladies and gentlemen, this is why worship on Sunday morning is more than 30 minutes of a song you may or may not like. It ain't got anything to do with it. It has to do with coming into that place. And it's not just for Sunday morning. And worship is not just music and songs. Worship is your whole life. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But being in that place, that easy place for us to come into, of seeking first the kingdom. The little woman with the issue of blood. What happened with her? Everybody else was coming up and touching Jesus and thronging around him, but only one saw him as a supply. It says over in Matthew, the ninth chapter, it says, and she said within herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. What was on the hem of his garment? You heard me teach this years ago. On the hem of his garment was the talit. And the talit was the representation of all the 613 laws. We all know that law can't redeem you. Law can't make you moral. Law can't make you holy. All the law does is point out the fact that to every man, your mouth must be stopped in all the world to see that they are guilty before God. The law is to bring you to the place of absolute hopelessness without him. So she says, that's the fulfillment. That little lady saw prophetically. She saw him as the source. If I touch him, he's the fulfillment of those things. He is the supply house. If I but touch that, I'll be made whole. And wow, she was made whole. All those places. The fruit of the Spirit of Galatians 5, That's not demands. That's not law. You better be more loving. You better be more patient. You better be more kind. You better be peaceful. And dadgummit, you better be gentle. Don't you be hard. <laughs> And you know, you got to be long suffering and you better be faithful and show up on time, do what you're supposed to do and please be temperate. No, none of those things are demands. Every one of the fruit of the spirit are supplies. Right. All you got to do is take them. You say, how do you know that pastor? In the 23rd verse, it says, all of these in essence is what he's saying are without law. In other words, you do these without law. You do these without a demand. You do these by totally receiving. Folks, if our receiver is broken, then we cannot take the supply. God desires to give us that supply. And finally, remember we talked about over in Zechariah. I love Ozek. Remember what we said last week that it was as they came back from the Babylonian captivity and they had done the base of the temple, but they went broke and they got discouraged. And so from 530 A.D. all the way down to about 514, somewhere in through there, the place just sat and everybody was discouraged. The demand was too big, just not a supply. God raises up Zechariah and Haggai to say, hey, guys, there is a place that you can go forth and see this thing get done. There is a supply. Then all of a sudden, Zechariah shows a prophetic word where he sees a golden candlestick there in that fourth chapter. 
And he sees the seven parts of it. And he sees the little bowls of oil on each one and pipes coming out and the olive oil, or excuse me, the olive trees on either side. So there was on both sides of that golden candlestick the agreement of God and his anointing. In other words, it was total and complete supply that was being shown them in the middle of being broke, disgusted, worn out, disappointed, and depressed. Whenever you've gone to that place, I have. And I tell you, a lot of times I would focus more on the place I'm in than the place he wants to take me, which is a place first that you don't see because the unseen is the real realm. Look at Zechariah 4, 6 and 7. You all know this just from last week. Zechariah 4, 6 and 7. You all know this quite well. Then he said to me, this was after he saw that vision. Zerubbabel was the governor who was putting this thing together. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Well, what was it the spirit was bringing? The supply for the depression, for the money, for the frustration, for the disappointment. Not by might, you can't do it. Not by power, you won't make it. By my spirit, you'll accomplish it, says the Lord of hosts. Then look at the next verse. Now, as I read this verse, I want you to think of one important thing. The supply was already given, but was it just automatic? Did it just automatically happen? Here's the supply. Everything's going to be great. No, there was a part where Zerubbabel had to release faith, and that's what we do. What are you, O great mountain? In other words, this challenge that's before them, where are you? Before Zerubbabel, you become a plane. In other words, it ain't going to be any more problem. And he will bring forth the top stone. Remember we said last week, the top stone is like the cornerstone. Who's the cornerstone? Jesus. With shouts of, here's what I want you all to do. Grace, grace to it. Is that just a little thing you say and all of a sudden it's kind of like an automatic and a little mantra? No. He's saying it is the supply of God you're coming into agreement with because in the demands of your life, whatever they may be, there is always grace that is greater. So I'll begin to speak that. Okay, now, in the middle of it, we said last week, now you receive the supply to become a supplier. Now the giver gives to you so that you may be a giver. So that carries us on into the whole place of generosity. Now I'm blessed to be a blessing. Does that mean that God can't bless without you? No, but he sure wants to use you. We were at a baseball game yesterday. Our little grandson, Caden, playing on a 9 and 10 baseball team. Man, they're good. And they're in a statewide championship. They have won every single game they've played. And they won yesterday 15 to 1. What was the second game? 15-0, and 8-4. 4 So they're wiping up. So he's feeling really macho, you know. They're feeling really good. But I watched the neatest thing yesterday. A granddad who was there went to another kid, not his child, after the game and gave him a $100 bill. And then gave another kid a $50 bill. And I'm just sitting there going, whoa, this is the spirit of generosity. I think I'll get a bat and a glove. <laughs> wow. I mean, folks, it was, it was like super amazing that all of a sudden, here's this dad, granddad. He wasn't, he wasn't a father. Most of the fathers would be my kid's age in their 30s or so. And then here was a couple of granddads like us, and he pulls out a $100 bill. I go, whoa. And it just hit me. That's the spirit of generosity. Now, you see, obviously he was supplied to be a supplier, but he was probably hearing what God had said in his heart. Folks, what's the purpose of giving? Why did God give giving? He wants to supply you first so you can be a giver second. But here's the reason for giving. It's not so the church can meet their bills. Thank God for it. If y'all didn't give, we wouldn't exist. Yes, I praise God for that. That's not the number one reason. Is it to give to God? No. Giving is for you. Because giving breaks selfishness and self-centeredness and the desire to hold on, particularly when things are tough, more than anything else. It's an open door to allow the new you to come on through as you give. 
And not just money, but your time and everything else. See, folks, we're not ever preaching in this church, never. Not giving to get, but getting to give. It's an opportunity. It's a blessing. I'm going to have uh, Renee come up again in a minute and say what she said to us at the end of the service last Sunday. A lot of you are already overeaten dinner and, and uh, didn't get to hear it. But I want to hear it again. I want you to hear it again because it's just so powerful. How all of a sudden, in the place of lack, the supply starts to show up because I'm releasing my faith in the inheritance that's already mine. I want you to look at a portion of scripture here that I think will be meaningful to you. Let's go over to John, the 12th chapter. John 12, verse 1. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, that was just a little bit of supply there for Lazarus, wasn't it? He came out band, uh, bound hand and foot, and he was liberated, loose him and let him go, and they did. Next verse. So they made him a supper there, and Martha, here's our old friend again, Martha was what? Serving. <laughs> Good old Martha. But Lazarus was one of those reclining, I love that, reclining at the table with him in a place of rest. Why was he in a place of rest? Honey, he'd received full supply from death to life, from being bound to being loosed, from being lost to being found. So what happens when you receive supply? Does this mean you get lazy and do nothing? No, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I worked harder than any of you, but not by me, by the grace of God that was within me. The message of grace is not laziness. The message of grace is not indolence. The, grace of, the message of grace is not just strictly sovereignty. What's going to happen anyway? Just do whatever you want. No, you take a mighty place in it just like Adam did to manifest your authority. So there they were reclining at the table in that place of rest because it had been supplied. Now read on. Next verse. Mary then, here we go, took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard, some call it, people call it spike nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Now let me call this right here. In the Bible, there's really, in, in giving, there's three kinds of giving. There's tithe, there's offering, and there's extravagant giving. Now, we don't teach that you have to tithe because you're not under that law. Now you want to go further than that. You don't want to just have it. See, that can become a demand. You better, you better, or God won't, God won't. That's not how it works. You give out of what the Holy Spirit tells you because none of your money is yours. It's all His. So look at this. Mary took a pound of very costly perfume of spike, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped His feet with her hair. See, the hair of the woman in that day was her picture of identity. So she says, my whole identity is to sit before the supply and be a blessing to him. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. <laughs> There's always a result to generosity. There's always a result that's forthcoming. Now look what happens here. Next verse. Ah, here's our old buddy Judas. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, next verse, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Why not? You think he cared anything about the poor? Heck no. Isn't it amazing, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus' arrest was all about money? Look at this next part. Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because it was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer or take out what was put in it. Jesus and them, they lived on offerings, just like any church does. They lived on offerings. And this rascal was going into the money box. I can imagine, if I knew I had a staff member that was pulling money out, which is hard for us to do because most of it's checks and internet stuff. But there was a day when we had mostly cash. And I'll tell you what, I'd have their tail out so quick they wouldn't know which way was up. 
Thank God I've never had that. I always had the greatest folks like Kinnett and all their fabulous, pray over the money, increase, wonderful. But you know what? This guy was doing that. He was pulling out the money out of what they had to live by. Next verse. Therefore, Jesus said, let her alone. Don't you all bother her one bit. She's given an extravagant offering so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Wow. You see, he didn't get anointed before his burial because he had the horrible time of the cross. He was anointed after he was in, I mean, after he died because then they brought a hundred pounds of aloes in order to put upon his body. But right coming off the cross, didn't have anything. So she was the last one that had anointed him. Let her alone that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Next verse. For you always have the poor with you, but you didn't always have me. Wow, what a powerful word. Now here it is, folks. The enemy of generosity is selfishness. The enemy of generosity is selfishness. And there's two kind of hearts that are seen here. Because see, giving's all about the heart. God wants your heart. He doesn't want your dollar bills. He wants your heart. And so you see a heart of generosity and a heart of greed. Isn't it amazing, like I said, that Satan used Judas Iscariot primarily over money, the 20 pieces of silver, taking the money out of the kitty. Greed was what totally encapsulated this man. It was all about money. God and Satan, the letter G, the letter S. God, generous. Satan, S, selfish, self-centered. All about me, my needs, my money. I don't have enough. I don't have this. <laughs> all of you know with your kids... When they were little, what was one of the first words they would say? Mine! That's mine! Mine! That's mine! That's mine! Daddy is mine! My older brother is just mine! And you go to the older brother, and the older brother, older sisters, they're saying, but, but Dad, it really is mine. And you say back to him, I don't care whether it's yours or not, I just want her to be quiet in the house. She's got some of my stuff too, let her have it. <laughs> Just shut up. Just give it to her. <laughs> I know you never had that in your house at all. Ever, ever, ever. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And see, that's what we can have about our money. I need it, I need it, I need it. I got to have it, got to have it. And sure you do. Of course you do. Got bills to pay, all that kind of thing. But here's what God says. Your money, the gold and the silver, it is mine. I'm not saying I'll take it away from you because they don't need it in heaven. The gold's still fine. You know in the New Jerusalem that it's 1,380 miles this way, 1,380 miles that way, and 1,380 miles this way. And all the ga gates are of pearl, of gold. I think he's got enough. Streets of gold are just fine. Sea of glass doesn't have a bunch of broken glass. God's not needing those finances, but he needs your heart in the place of it. Here this woman gives you all an extravagant gift. Let me tell you, when it says 300 denarii are denarius, here's how they figured it in that day. One denarius was a day's work. 300 denarii, almost a year's worth of this oil that she breaks it. You know, she could have taken just a little bit and just poured it on. She busted that thing and put it all over him. A year's wages. That's an extravagant gift. Wow. You ever had an extravagant gift given to you? Or the Lord said, give an extravagant gift. And you're not just giving it. Remember to get. You know what, Mary? Mary wasn't. She wouldn't said, oh, I'm giving this so I can give something back. No, she was giving it unto the Lord, an extravagant gift. And yet here's what happens in that place of generosity. An extravagant gift will always come back to you. Always come back to you. I had an extravagant gift given to me a few years ago. It was so wonderful. The Lord had spoken to me. And just please, I'm not putting a halo on my head at all. This ain't no big deal. But the Lord had spoken to me about giving some money to another ministry, not here. And it was kind of an expedient thing. I had to do it. Some of what my son was involved with. And 
So I ended up giving, uh, for me, an extravagant gift. I felt like it was God. And after I gave it, I just said, Lord, let this become a seed, let it be whatever you want. I know when I give, it's not saying, oh, God going, oh, that's good. Now I'm going to give you some more. No. It's releasing faith in the inheritance that's already mine. So anyway, I just gave it, gave it in faith. And all of a sudden, well, it wasn't all that suddenly. A while later, a year or so later, an old buddy of mine calls and says, I want to give you my entire music studio. Everything in it, soundboard, mixers, mics, everything. And this was a big professional music studio, Antoine. And he says, if you'd like to have all the equipment or I will send it all to Atlanta and we will have it sold and you take all the money for it. Shipped all this stuff from California. Whole music studio come rolling in and got sold at a consignment place up in Atlanta. This would be now four or five years ago. And then on top of it, that guy comes back then and gives us an automobile. That's extravagant. Now, all I did was say, God, you want me to release faith in our inheritance and you have me give a seed. Praise God. I wasn't expecting something back. And then boom, there it was. That's my extravagant God. He's that way. But the hard part is then when he calls you to give an extravagant gift. And y'all, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Y'all are some of the most generous people. I just want to say thank you. People in this church are extravagant givers. And I praise you for it. And I want you to know, please, don't you go out here saying, well, pastor preached that today because things must be tight money-wise. No, we're fine. I didn't do one of those deals where I preach on generosity, then take the offering. No, I'm talking about this is for you. This is not something I'm trying to do for us. So why was old Judas talking about the poor? He wanted it for himself. He wanted his money for himself. What if the Lord speaks to you about something to give and you hold on to it? then you're doing what that little kid said. Mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's not, it's not. No, it's his, it's his. And he'll speak to you. And what a blessing it'll be back to you because it does a work in your heart. Now here's a question. Why did Jesus give the money box to Judas? He knew he was stealing. There was no place in the scripture that said, all right, get your hand out of there. Well, here's just a thought. Two years before, Jesus had said this word. He said, have I not chosen you 12, but one of you is the devil? He knew all before. <laughs> he knew. But he was allowing him to be tested. God doesn't tempt you now. You know what the book of James says. He doesn't tempt you. But he will allow you to be tested for your blessing, for your help. And so I think he allowed Judas to be tested so that he could have brought him out of this serious addiction of greed that was upon him. Wow. Didn't work. And Judas ended up taking his own life out of that place of guilt. Now, here's the key, y'all. If we say that Jesus has our heart, I don't fully know that he has your heart if he doesn't have your money. Out of the treasure, out of your, your heart comes the treasures of your heart. Out of the treasure, you are what your treasure is. What you treasure is where your heart's at. So if it's mine, it's mine. Or if it's his. Why? He wants you to be a supply. He's calling you to be a supplier. And what a glorious and wonderful ministry that is. And I want to tell you, there's a result that always comes from it. The house is filled with the fragrance of God. 
Now, don't you all see my preaching today as a demand? It's not. It's a supply opportunity. It's an opportunity for your coffers to be filled. I heard one preacher talking about, he was met, speaking to another minister, and they went by a house, great big pretty house. And uh, the one pastor was going with them, said, uh, oh, wow, look at that great big house over there. And the pastor he was riding with says, yeah, that's the guy that's in our church. He's really, really a generous person. And uh, he said, ah, uh, uh, that's extravagant. He ought to sell that and give that to the poor. And so the first pastor came back and said, I disagree with you 100%. Because if you really believe that, you'd sell your house and give it to the poor. Because you're making giving instead of being a gift, you're making it a demand, which turned it into a law, which is turning it into you've got to, rather than taking the place of saying, Holy Spirit, it's all, it's all yours. How do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you, how do you want me to give? And not just money again, y'all. It can be whatever. And I believe God brings that reward. So generosity is giving expecting no return. Selfishness is giving and believing God owes you something. That's a demand. That's law. That's not supply. But here's the great thing. God is always going to bring back that generosity to you because you're just keeping planting, reaping, planting, reaping, planting, reaping, going on all the time. That constant process. In the meantime, your bills become better. Your debt becomes better. You can go and get up with Tierra at that conference and get your credit fixed and get it working out. All these things are practical things. God starts to bring wisdom to us. You know the word over in Hebrews eleven six. 6, you all know that. Without faith it's impossible to please God. <clears throat> and they that come to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You know that word reward there doesn't just mean, hey, you find my wallet, I give you uh, $50. The only time in the New Testament is this word for reward spoken. It has five syllables to it. Mista podotes. Say that after me. No. <laughs> <laughs> the last part of it makes it a word that doesn't just say, here's a reward, I give it to you. No, it means an extravagant reward. And that extravagant reward would be, no, if you, you brought my billfold back to me, you found it. I'm not going to give you $50. I'm going to give you $5,000. I'm going to give you a load of funds. Now that extravagance is what God gives to us, not because you give. Because remember what the first part of that verse said? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So when we're giving, ladies and gentlemen, it's just a place of releasing that faith. It's a place of saying God, I give as a release of faith in what's already provided as an inheritance. Wow. Look at one more place, and then we'll pray. 2 Corinthians 8, just for a second. Greatest chapter on giving, 2 Corinthians 8 and 2 Corinthians 9. Y'all still out there? So quiet on this July Sunday. Do you know I've been here now 15 and a half years. I've never preached on giving one time. Never have. Never one time. And as I say to you again, I'm not up here trying to extract funds out of you. I'm trying to let you see the incredible gift that giving is to you. For God so loved the world that he, he has only begotten. Son. Right. He's an incredible giver. And so are you. You see, I can say today, if I'm worried about funds, God, you've given us the spirit of giving. And now, as we had a chance to read over in 2 Corinthians 9, he not only provides the bread that is to pay your bills, get things done, but he wants you first to seek him for seed, for planting. Like the God has sent me the studio. He wants to send you a seed for planting. Almost that before you believe in God for the bread to get through your bills and pay off your car and make sure your house notes on time. 
and that your credit cards and all the things that may have been bothering you, he's saying, I want to provide your seed first to keep the continuum going because that's part of the kingdom. That's part of your inheritance. Look over here. Verse 1. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God. Now, this is so cool. I've said it before. He calls giving grace. Why? Why was he called grace giving? Five times in this chapter, he calls grace giving. Because he has you doing the same thing as a supply receiver that the supplier does. Because the supplier gives to you, not because you deserve it, not because you demand it, but because he loves you. And because he values you. So we take that same grace and then give it. So the Apostle Paul see, is trying to take up an offering for the poor and for a lot of the challenges that are in Jerusalem. So he's going to collect an offering. Titus has been out helping him to collect this offering. So now he says, you know what? You guys started out to want to give this offering. And that's great. But you know what? You didn't complete it. You didn't complete it. So I'm here to encourage you. And here's what the Apostle Paul does. Just a little positive pressure. He says, the churches in Macedonia are already given. How about you all? They've already been given over here. And you know what? They're broke. And they're giving out of their emptiness. So now, brethren, we just make known to you the grace of God which has been given to the church of Macedonia. And Macedonia would probably have been Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and those places. So he says, which have been given in the churches of Macedonia. Next verse. That in a, notice this now, a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance, here's your giving now, of joy, and their deep poverty. That sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. How could a broke person overflow in the wealth of liberality? I'll tell you how. It's grace. In the middle of their lack, they were looking to the supply more than to the lack. And obviously the supply showed up. That's what I started out by saying in this message today. And I say it to you again. See the supply. Seek first the kingdom of God. Mary and Martha, the five loaves and fishes, the wedding feast at Cana, the man at the pool of Bethesda with a demand. And he saw God as his supply. Next verse. For I testify that according to their ability, look at this, according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying you don't give beyond what you can afford ever. But you take every opportunity to say, Holy Spirit, none of this is mine. It's all yours. I'm not mine, mine, mine. It's yours. So the same grace that has supplied me is now the grace that I give, not out of demand, not out of got to, out of a cheerful heart, as it says over in 2 Corinthians 9. And now in that place of giving, it does something to my heart. Let me ask you this final question. We'll pray. Is there anything you could give to God that would impress God? You already know the answer. I say there is. Not an amount. Not a dollar sign. Not how much. Not giving a gold bar. Not giving a recording studio. Those things are glorious and wonderful. When God speaks an extravagant gift, give it. It's fabulous. But you know what? There is a place. There is absolutely a place that would move God. Go to verse 5 there, Jennifer. Look at this, everybody, at the screen. We'll pray. It says, and this, not as we had first expected, but now here's what impresses God. But they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. He wants your heart. He's not after the amount. He wants you to hear about that, not as a demand. You better tithe. You better do this. You got to do that. God won't bless you. The windows of I want to tell you the windows of heaven were open on the day of Pentecost. 
Your giving doesn't open the windows of heaven. Honey, they're already open. Your faith just releases them. Remember what I said about Zerubbabel and Zechariah? Was the oil already shown and the olive trees on both sides? There was the provision was there, but God says, say grace to it. He says money was grace and the grace was the supply. The demand is you better. The grace is you got the opportunity. Wow. So now he first gave themselves. Here's all I'm saying, folks. In the place of giving, the place of giving is the place of releasing what you want to what he wants. It's another part of the new covenant. My life is not my own. I'm bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which is the Lord's. Renee, come up. I want you to hear this one more time. I want you to share. <laughs> Come on up here. She shared this last week. I thought it was so good. It blessed me. Um, we were in really a time of need. I had gotten sick and could no longer go back to work. And so our finances were a wreck and we didn't know what we were going to do. And we made a decision at that time to become givers. We, that was just something we decided to do. Um, had been hearing some talk about it at the church we were in and, and we didn't really feel like we had that spiritual gift, but we decided we were going to do that anyway. So we did, we started to give and we were given out of what we didn't have because we were, um, in lack at that point. So we began to do that and God began to provide in ways that are amazing that is still going on today. And um, several times he's given me things and told me things through the years um, about our finances. And uh, recently he, and I think Gerald it was, was talking about carrying this money around to, to bless people, carrying blessing money. We used to call it mad money, but <laughs> it's blessing money. That's right. And um, God came to me one day and gave me the picture of this flowing oil. I don't know if y'all have seen that mm -hmm. on the internet with the, the Bible that's sitting in that tub of oil. And as these people give this oil away, God keeps replenishing that's the right. oil. And he there told me, if you will continue to give away the money that I have you put and, and lead you to give, then I will continue that source. It will never run dry. And, and one day he spoke to me and he said, um, money's not a problem for me and it's not going to be one for you. And he said, I can get money from a fish's mouth. If, if I need it. That's great. So every now and then I tell him, let's go fishing, you know. <laughs> we need to go fishing. <laughs> but um, it, it's been such a blessing at what he's taught us about money. And, and one of the major things he taught me way back was um, don't eat your seed. That's right. For one thing, That's don't right. eat your seed. Amen. And um, rejoice when God blesses somebody else because he didn't have to take from you to give to them. Amen. He has enough for everybody. It's all he is. He, doesn't, he does not have to take from you to bless somebody else. So rejoice when somebody else is blessed. That's great. I that's don't good. know if that was Oh, that's perfect. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's good. That's great. Stand, everybody. Oh, sure. Yeah. Stand up, everybody. Come on, stand everybody. Yeah. Uh, sure, you're just not feeling good? Okay. <laughs>